Okay, kids, grab a s'more and take a seat around the fire. Here's a scary story. <laughs> Where is this going? It was early one morning, and my dear friend Shuko had to get up extra, extra early. <laughs> Our alarm was ticking away. 4 a.m., 59 minutes and 55 seconds. I'd never be awake at that time. 4 a.m., 59 minutes, 56 seconds. He'd have to pay me for it. <laughs> 57 seconds, and ring! The alarm goes off. But that was nothing compared to what was about to happen next. Oh, God. <laughs> As Shuko stepped into the shower, she closed the curtain and turned on the water. As usual, she let it run in the bathtub for a few seconds to let the cold water come out before the wonderful warm water comes. But because it was so early and she was so tired, she was running on autopilot. <laughs> As the water rose through the pipes, she got into position for a warm, comforting morning shower. <laughs> expecting the first drops to hit her head any second now, and then it sputtered out at full pressure. But it was ice cold! <laughs> Little did Shuko know, her boiler had stopped working, and she had no idea why. From know-how to wow. The Bosch Global Podcast. Well, I can tell you the fairy tale version of that story, where the boiler got fixed before Shuko even knew there was a problem. An even better person to tell that story is Christoph. We try to avoid that any one of our customers takes cold showers. So obviously I wasn't one of these customers in, in the nightmare story. Yeah, but, that's why it's a scary story. <laughs> but um, I don't know what it's like in the US, but here in Europe, or in Germany specifically, heating and hot water is on everybody's mind. That's because prices for natural gas are skyrocketing, and many of our homes depend on gas for heating and hot water. I think this is such a timely topic for us right now. In mm. fact, on the cover of my weekly news magazine, the title story is The Right Way to Fix the Energy Crisis. Increasing costs for energy is a legitimate concern for many people. And as you were saying, it's not just the, you know, the cost of energy, it's also the scarcity of it, of course. Exactly. Um, you know, we don't have enough renewable energy available yet. And we kind of want to be mindful of not wasting fossil fuels. Which, I mean, we've, we've spoken a lot about that on this show. But one way that we want to look into that in this episode is data. And we're not saying that data can solve the energy crisis. But data is at the core of an ongoing revolution that helps us better understand and adjust our use of energy. In heating systems, data can enable advanced analytics that unveil inefficiencies. A team at Bosch invented a word for it. Uh, yes. So, heatlytics. Did he say heatlytics? Heatlytics, of course. Heatlytics is a mixture between it and analytics. Heatlytics is also Alex's job. Alessandra Chambel, and I'm sure I did not quite pronounce that right. Could we have the tone for his name that he says himself? I'm Alex, uh, Alshan Chambel. Thank you very much. And Alex is a data scientist at Bosch Thermotechnology in Portugal. And is all the part that deals with the data logging, with the data processing, with the data visualization, all this time series, all this process, are part of the analytics. The data that Alex analyzes comes from connected heating appliances. So by connected heating appliances, you mean boilers, heat pumps, mm -hmm. anything that heats water for domestic hot water or mm -hmm. for heating, right? Mm -hmm. And I assume most of these have an internet connection these days. Uh, most either have an internal gateway or can be connected to one. And they're packed with all kinds of sensors that are generating just enormous number of data points. In general, our appliances, they have multiple sensors, multiple controllers, actuators. You have a temperature sensor creating data points. A pressure sensor creating data points. Probably a valve. And certainly another valve. And all these components are connected to a bus. These components are sending their data onto a communication pathway, which is called a bus. And each of these components generates some message. And the data points are wrapped in what are called envelopes. And this message contain single or multiple data points. Huh. 
how many of these data points and messages are buzzing through the bus? Well, Alex didn't have a specific number of data points, but messages, yes. If we go to a typical appliance, for example, heat pump, usually we have between 10,000, 15,000 messages a day. Oh, wow, that's a lot. I was thinking more around the, like the inbox <laughs> types of messages. <laughs> a little more than that. It depends also on the season, because on the winter, as you can imagine, the data that is transmitted, the data that is logging, is much more because everything is always changing. Gotta make it warm. Gotta have hot water. <laughs> make it even warmer. Cool down for the night. On the other side, on summer, some appliances transmit just small bits of information. Because, for example, if you are on holidays, the appliance is not doing anything or almost anything. I'm surprised that a heating system can generate that much data. I mean, the level of detail must be much higher than what I expected it to be. Yes, indeed. Uh, we already said temperature and pressure. But here are some other data points. If you have a valve, you know how much the valve is open, how much is closed, for how long it stayed in a certain position, how much time it took to open from 0%, for example, to 50% or to 100%. If you are talking about the heat pump, the heat pump have an electrical heater as well. So we know when the electrical heater is turned on, turned off, for how long, for example. Also, what is the power that we are putting on the electrical part? If you have a switch, we can know how many times the switch were pressed, for example. Or if you have a relay, you can also know how many times the relay were activated. Alex knows all of these minuscule details because our data messages traveled on the bus until they reached the gateway. And from there, they went through the internet to their quote-unquote forever home, which is a data storage center. But... I mean, this data storage center, they're not just stored there for the sake of storing them, right? Uh, no, of course not. So Alex is going to use them in some sort of way. So the, the data points and all the information that we stored afterwards is processes. So. Right. So Alex writes the algorithms to process the data. And different algorithms function for different types of data. Before this information being usable, the data needs to be translated to a more human-readable and structured format. And then its process is uh, used to generate further insights with techniques like feature engineering, algorithms. All these are working on top of this data and generate insights. That and we need to remember that, that it's the second step, which is generating the insights. Finding ways to run the appliance more efficiently and sustainably, which is what this all, all is for. The first step, though, is dealing with the stuff that needs immediate attention. Some of the information, for example, like the errors, they are processed in near real time and they are used to send notifications to the users. Which makes sense. I mean, error messages get high priority, as they should. Yes, of course. And so these pesky errors can be dealt with. Uh, but by whom? Who are the actual users of this data? It's focusing for installers. This is Christoph Bauerdick. Christoph works a few doors down from Alex. I'm working as a product owner for a remote diagnosis tool. And he uses the data points and data analysis from Alex. And the other error messages. And the other error messages to build a tool that has one very important purpose, as we heard before. What we do with our tool, in short, we try to avoid that any one of our customers takes cold showers. <laughs> <laughs> and I do think that's probably the most important technology we've ever discussed on the show. Never start your day with a cold shower. Uh, we, we talk about invented for life and what kind of quality of life is without hot showers. The tool he builds with his team is called HomeCom Pro. With it, an installer can visualize all of these data points from the heating system he or she has installed. You see at one glance that everything is okay with your portfolio. So with your connected appliances that you are monitoring online, you see everything is in a green state. Or if something is wrong, you also see this and you're notified immediately. And you see that in a, a traffic light code with yellow or, or red. And it's really nice, of course, when everything's green. But I guess when our little traffic lights turn yellow or even red, 
that's when things get interesting. Interesting or complicated, because imagine what the installer knows without the system. Let's say your shower was cold and you would call your heating guy. <laughs> Where would you even begin? What would you say? Yeah, uh, exactly. You, <laughs> you as the, as the end user, have to say, yeah, hey, um, the water's cold. Come help me. <laughs> and I, I mean, that's pretty much it. What else, what else can you say? Um, and so I, I know what you're aiming at. I, I'm not a heating guy. I, as an IT guy, I can tell you there's kind of uh, some, some basic things you want to know. And when you get poor error descriptions, which is basically something is wrong, you, you're really starting at zero trying to fix a problem. So it's exactly what you're saying. You're familiar with this issue. In many cases where there are problems, it's often difficult to reproduce Again. Basically, what you need is more data. Every 12 seconds, we take a snapshot and visualize this to the installer. And that's the short version of what Alex described to us before. The installer can look at the data and not only see a detailed error message, but also a history of how the appliance behaved in the hours or days leading up to the error. And you don't need to be at the installation and try to re-provoke the error, you can just check what was happening, looking at the data. So picture this. He's still in his office. The installer already knows exactly why your shower was cold and how to fix it. So does HomeCom Pro system tell him that exactly as well? It at least makes a suggestion for a spare part. We can really give the exact right spare part recommendation for that specific appliance that is in need. And if you think that sounds obvious and simple, you might be surprised how complex such a recommendation can be. Shuko, please tell us more. <laughs> See, this is a nicer version of the story. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, of course, there's a quite big variation of appliances that you have at home. You have a heat pump and gas boilers. You have small systems for households and big systems for hospitals. You have different gas types. You have a underfloor heating or radiators. And then you have a variety of different models too. So all of this leads to a complex system of decision trees. We have currently for our German portfolio roughly 300,000 failure trees in our system. 300,000 trees. That's, that's quite the forest. Wow. Let's say it again. 300,000 trees. That's not 300,000 endpoints at the branches, mm. but at the roots, right? Exactly. So 300,000 faults that heating appliances can possibly have. But that's, of course, not for just one heat pump, for instance, but across the entire portfolio. And it covers all the combinations with various system components, depending on the individual need of different buildings. You have one fault and one fault can be caused by multiple causes. And for each cause, we are providing then a suggestion and a solution. In some, it's changing parameters, or in some, it's like going to the appliance and changing spare parts. When the installer eventually shows up at your doorstep to fix your cold shower situation, they already have the correct spare part in their car. So they don't need to come a second time. Oh, I really like that. And so do I. No need to wait for more days of cold shower. <laughs> and this will become even more important in the future. The complexity of systems will increase as each house is so individual that it more and more needs an individual solution. The spare part availability at the installer is more difficult to realize. And this is where, again, the ordering comes into place and you might not have it in your car when you arrive at the customer. So here, being aware and knowing what spare part to take is key and something that Homecom Pro is providing. Speaking of the future, there's much more that Christoph has planned. New ways in which Homecom Pro could use the data. And the same holds true for Alex and Helytics. There's a lot more interesting stuff to come, but it's not without its challenges. They're both working on helping people to run their appliances as close to their optimum performances as possible. But I'll park that. We'll talk about that in a minute. I got really curious, Jeff. Is it a complete fictional example that your cold shower would be analyzed by a data scientist? I mean, that is to say, how do you make heat and hot water in your home? And how does the system generate not only heat, but data as well? So, Shuko, I have an idea. Um, 
just just for for example, what we could do, we could we could switch over quickly to a video call on our phones, and I could take mm-hmm. you I could take you down to my my infrastructure room where yes. you could see that. So we're walking in right now. That noise you hear is actually the dehumidifier because it's summer here in Chicago and there's quite a lot of water in the air. Then we have all of our appliances. We have the central vacuum. We have the pump for the well because we're not on the city water supply. We have the water softener to take all the iron out. And then finally, we have the uh, intake for the gas coming from the service provider, which then splits off and goes first to the water heater and then to the furnace, both of which are burning natural gas to either heat up water or heat up the air in the winter that then is blown through the house because that's how we do it here in North America. So I hope that gives you a little little visualization. I'll send you a pic too, just, just to be clear. So, uh, yeah. Okay. I'm in a rented flat, mm-hmm. and I have to admit, I haven't, maybe I should look into it more now that the situation's getting mm-hmm. a little bit drastic, but um, yeah, I have to admit, I haven't really thought about all of these things beforehand. And now, because it's a very current topic, all of a sudden you really start asking yourselves questions. Okay, is it a, you know gas driven or mm-hmm. is this electricity or is it whatever? But as said, I think the interest wasn't really there because of the fact that I am in a rented flat. Yes, certainly that is a, a main driver. And it's, uh, I can tell you now that I'm uh, again a homeowner, since moving back from Germany, I'm much more sensitive to little sounds in the house when I hear a machine kick on and it doesn't quite sound the way it normally does. Now, I don't know. But so in your case, you definitely want, wish for more data in that sense, right? Oh, to understand absolutely. where all of these coming absolutely. from. Absolutely. <laughs> and I would love it if there was a third party installer that had that visibility and could leverage all that data and actually use it for decisions. That would be really, really fascinating. I guess we'll get there, but then I have to make some... Uh, Call it uh, capital expenditures on my house. <laughs> Which will be worthy of investments, I'm sure. Well, I'm sure my wife won't complain. <laughs> but while we go back to our home podcast studios, maybe let's hear how Christoph heats his apartment. Actually, as it's a rented flat and as oh, I live go. there only <laughs> <See>? <laughs> f- while this international assignment, so for those two years, it's a pretty old one. Just like me. It's a Bosch one. So it, it says how reliable our products are. But it doesn't give me the data that I would like to see. But I do look at the hybrid system of my parents. And here I do a lot of, like I created a dashboard, which really checks how often the heat pump works, how often the boiler works and stuff like that. He can also come by to our flat and do that as well if he wants. (laughs) Yeah, we could call it the uh, infrastructure 2.0 program. Exactly. So one way to make heating CO2 neutral is instead of burning natural gas, burning hydrogen. There are now boilers that are hydrogen ready and can easily be converted once green hydrogen is widely available. And actually, dear listeners, if you'll recall, we did make a whole episode about that. And Bosch just announced a further investment of several hundred million euros to promoting our hydrogen economy technologies. Well, hello, Tom Collins again as well. There's this myth, there's this understanding. Everybody knows it's just not possible to have a hydrogen boiler. And I thought that that can't be true. So we went back to our R&D site at Bosch and a, a few engineers got together and we decided to, to build one. Go back a few episodes in our feed or find the link in the show notes. It's one of my favorites. So coming back to the podcast. um, So of course, we shouldn't delay being as climate friendly as possible into the future. We must act now. And since every little thing can help, I got curious when I was making tea. I have multiple ways of heating water in my home. Which one is the best for climate, do you think? I'm sure you're going to tell me. Well, I did not go to the extent of measuring the power consumption of my kettle, but I did a bit of research online, as usual, Mm -hmm. and I found some good information on Insight Energy, uh, which is a collaborative journalism initiative in the United States. And you know what? Let's turn this into my favorite, a quiz. Oh, no. (laughs) All right, let's do it. So, Jeff, as my only participant, willing or not, (laughs) here is the million-dollar question. What is the most efficient way to bring water to boil? Is it A, an electric kettle, B, an electric stove, 
C, a microwave? Or D, a gas stove? Are they using renewable electricity or electricity from renewable sources? How that energy is generated is a separate question. Let's assume that the most efficient is also the most climate friendly. Okay. Um, kettles made specifically for boiling water, but I, I mean, the microwave is tuned in a way that the electromagnetic waves specifically mm -hmm. heat water molecules. So that's kind of the, the point. Um, I'm going to say microwave. Microwaves for $1 million? Yes, microwave is my final answer. The microwave only has an efficiency of about 50%. Mm -hmm. The rest of the energy is lost in the conversion of electricity to electromagnetic waves. An electric kettle, however, gets 80% of the energy in oh. the water. Wow. So that's pretty good. But uh, what about the other two, electric stove or gas stove? So a gas stove range is not really any better, no. It's about 70% efficient. And for the electric stove tops, it all depends. So it depends on what kind of stove top you have. Um, the classic ones are not great, also at about 70%. But if you have an induction stove top, that's the clear winner with an efficiency of about 85%. Uh -huh. Induction, yep, that's great. So <laughs> uh, interesting. So that's the most efficient. Second is the kettle. So, okay. Uh, followed by any other stovetop and microwave is last. Correct. All right. See, at least my quizzes bring a certain new knowledge to the table. I appreciate all your extra homework. Thank you. So in reality, the values I give can differ a lot. Sure. I mean, I already mentioned it depends on many, many factors. For instance, how well the kettle is insulated or what materials the pots are made out of that you use on whatever stovetop. So it's a bit misleading to present you only with four options to begin with, but I'd still wanted to do it. And as you see, reality is more complicated, as always. As always, indeed. <laughs> and I think that that illustrates very well how complicated it is to determine efficiency in heating as well. And I mean, after all, what it boils down to, get it? Uh, what it boils down <laughs> to oh, is... <laughs> how long have you been waiting to use that? Come on. <laughs> It, it practically wrote itself. <laughs> True. Um, Served on a silver platter. Indeed. Uh, but what it boils down to is heating water as well. The Heatlytics mm -hmm. team has also realized that and that giving people advice on how to save energy actually also gets complicated pretty quickly. Mm. For instance, uh, the, the question whether or not you should turn off the heating during the day when you're not at home. Alex, what do you think about that? That is a quite tricky question. A lot depends on the type of house that, that you have and the inertia that your house have. Uh, you, you might actually save energy during the day that way, but then you have to put in more energy in the evening to bring the house back up to that comfortable temperature you prefer. So the math is not straightforward. Each case, you need to look at other variables. And that's why the information about the surroundings, the information about the building, the information about some habits as well, make a lot of difference in that kind of calculations. And Alex might have all that contextual data about the appliance, but without the additional context of the environment, what's going around, that makes it more difficult. So what is happening around the appliance? What kind of house is installed? How is installed? What is the kind of circuits? What is the type of building? So what's the other infrastructure around that appliance like? Is it installed in a modern home that's very well insulated and, you know, the windows are, are you know, really locked down tight? Or are we in a barn? Um, without that kind of information, it's very difficult, if not relatively impossible, to calculate whether it's running efficiently. If we are talking about an appliance that is controlled by a room controller, where is the room controller? Because the room controller is reading the temperature somewhere, but where? Is it in the bathroom? Is it in the living room? It is in a bedroom. Uh, it is in the, the hallway. That limits the amount of information he can derive from the data. That limits the decision-making ability. He would like to give people advice on how to improve the performance of an appliance, but so far he really can't. It's a challenge. It's a challenge to, to even say if, for example, this appliance is efficient, yes or no. I really get his pain. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it does sound like a big challenge. Um, when thinking about who does have a lot of that information, installers, right? Mm -hmm. Christoph knows their needs. Mm -hmm. One big aspect of the tool that I developed with my team um, 
giving a use case where the installer also is happy to enter those information, those metadata about the building, et cetera. They know their clients, theoretically, and they know the installation. They know whether a building is facing north. Uh, I mean, all of the details that Alex was mentioning. And it would be useful for them to have that information stored and accessible. Because whenever you're looking remote at something, you're not in the building, so you don't know is it faced to south or to north, which has already an impact on the heating. Once Christoph and his team gets this data from the installers, they can then launch the next level of HomeCom Pro. An easy next step is to give ranges of, hey, what is normal for your building or what is normal for your appliance? And here say, oh, you're in a good range or not. So this information would be given to the installer so they can adjust the parameters of the installation. The last stage would be to automate this entire process and making the suggestions of parameterization already without the human interacting in between. So we're going to be putting the installer intelligence, their know-how, into an automated system. Somehow that's kind of troublesome. It's interesting that it could be done, but should we take this route? Is that really necessary? You're asking if this would replace installers? I, I, su I suppose that's where yeah. we're going. Yeah, so the answer to that is no. The system would make adjustments for that no installer does today. So nobody is constantly monitoring a system and then fine-tuning it, for example. That is only possible with automation. And to your question, is it necessary? Yes, because... because our hardware systems, they have been developed for decades. Bosch is working on heating appliances for almost forever. <laughs> <laughs> that means there's almost no way you can make a modern boiler or a heat pump more efficient by changing its components. Well, yes and no. Always challenging me. Yes. Internally, we use this data to improve the quality of our appliances. All of the data that is available, that's already infinitely more than what was available before. And so Alex shares the insights he generates and shares them with the respective engineering departments. We can look at, for example, the design of appliances. If they are operating in the right conditions or the conditions that we imagine uh, that they were going to be used. And thanks to the data, they know better than ever before how a big number of appliances are behaving out in the field. And it can adapt, for example, make some components more robust because in the end they are going to be used in a different condition and much more than we expected. So all this information can be used, for example, in a better design and more adequate appliances. And if your appliance is adequate for its use, that contributes to the efficient use of resources. And of course, more data is always good. So knowing the context of an installation would help improve the hardware as well. Alex shares one situation where, due to a lack of knowledge about the environment around an appliance, they first thought that there was something wrong with its design. We had complaints that the appliances were blocking or locking or not working. And then later we discovered that uh, was not in fact uh, error or in the design of the appliance, but uh, by analyzing the data, we noticed that in very extreme weather conditions and the way that the, the appliances were installed and, and some pipes, the way they were installed, they were freezing. And that was the cause of the problem. And doing this analysis and understanding and all the data and also with the weather data, we discovered that in extreme conditions, that pipes cannot be installed like that. It was a conclusion that was based on data and where the data helped a lot to understand the problem. So that's one way data helps heating systems run better. And the other is tweaking each individual system continuously so that it runs in an optimal way each day, whilst taking the challenging environmental conditions into account. And learning not just from momentary snapshots, like for example when an installer comes to the house and looks at the appliance, but from all the data collected during its lifetime. You can look at long periods of data, whether then just looking at the data as a snapshot when you're at the appliance. And this provides knowledge, this provides possibilities for optimization. And then also everything that we were discussing before, like the entire topic about optimization and data, this is um, 
yeah, helping on bringing down energy consumption and also energy costs. And I think that sums it up pretty well. Data provides knowledge that was not previously available. Mm. And with that knowledge, rise opportunities for improvement at every step along the way. Bosch can build better appliances, installers can offer better service, and end customers can save energy and money. Inventive for life, right? That's right. <laughs> and end customers also get a better sense for how much energy they use. Mm -hmm. uh, so instead of receiving a bill every once in a while, sometimes only you know once a year, they mm -hmm. can now see at any point in time how much energy is actually consumed. And I think that awareness will also help save energy. And for that, they can use smart home systems and apps, which we haven't really talked about in this episode. We'll have to save that for another time. All the wonderful things we do at Bosch. Mm -hmm. But so that's it. One small step towards more efficient heating is hooking up that boiler or heat pump to the internet and making use of that data. Should we leave our listeners with a teaser for the next episode? Of course. We'll talk about more sustainability, but this time on the road. We'll have a look at how the development of fossil fuels for cars and trucks is coming along. There are some very interesting developments going on there. And until then, subscribe to this podcast if you haven't already and follow Bosch Global on social media. See you then. See you next month. From know-how to wow. The Bosch Global Podcast.